As always, it is uh, beautiful to hear you sing the Word. What a privilege to read the Word, uh, to pray the Word, to sing the Word of our God, and to, to have that, that voice of His people ringing within our ears. May it touch deep within our hearts. We can read, sing, pray the Word, and we hear it preached as well. And our, our, our text for this morning's sermon is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One. Please join me in asking for God's blessing upon his word. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for your word and we remember that you had spoken this word and in so many different ways to so many different people amongst so many different times and places. We remember as well, O Lord, that your word does not change. What you have spoken endures forever. And we are, we are so grateful to know that that word promised and fulfilled in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it does not change, but stands firm and remains powerful forever and ever. Oh, that you would bring your Holy Spirit now to open our ears to share in these great things of Christ. It's in his name we ask. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we begin reading this morning at verse 10. Uh, congregation, this is God's word. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, you, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers, What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas, Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where? Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So far the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Beloved congregation, this morning we continue our little series titled Ordinary, Ordinary Christianity. You may remember that prayers for this series developed out of a study, our ongoing study of Genesis and uh, my sabbatical studies and Paul's letters 
rather Paul's letter to 1 Corinthians. While traveling across country over the summer, I, I saw Genesis everywhere, it seemed. Everywhere from the things of the created order, the moon and the stars, the great and the small, all of it speaking of our great God's beauty. The created order, common grace, the ways that he continues to preserve all that he has made even amongst a sinful and rebellious world. And then it seemed with each passing mile there was another church you could glimpse on the horizon, a church testifying to the greater purpose of it all. Or, as I couldn't help myself wondering, maybe they weren't. Maybe that wasn't why they believed they were there. I couldn't help but ask what it was. What would they say they stood for? You may know that if you follow the, 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 the statistics, statistical study, it's pretty clear that, that churches are going through a kind of identity crisis today. They're struggling. Uh, members are leaving. It's reported that a, a fallout of the pastorate is at an all-time high. Of course, I'm not saying that statistics tell the whole story, far from it. But it is clear that Christianity is facing a troubled season. And diagnosing the problem is not easy. It seems to me that not only the light of God's word in general, but especially the light of 1 Corinthians is particularly helpful. As we heard last week, the Corinthian appeal to Paul, Apollo, Cephas, or Christ, it is an expression of, uh, of something deeper. As they would appeal to this preacher or teacher or the next, it wasn't simply an expression of personal preference, like we might prefer an R.C. Sproul over a Mike Horton, or Mike Horton over a Dr. Godfrey, or a Calvin over a Luther. That, was, that wasn't what was happening there. But rather, that, that, that appeal to various pastors and teachers was a reflection of a deeper division, what we might say a fundamental confusion that had arised, had arised within the body. And at first, it doesn't appear to be a confusion or a corruption of the gospel itself. That was the case in Galatia. You remember as Paul wrote to the Galatian church that he is just shocked. They are abandoning the gospel, the true gospel, for some other gospel. It doesn't appear to be his concern in Corinth. Rather, what he is addressing in these chapters, at least the first four chapters of the letter, is a confusion over the means of the gospel. What it seems the Corinthians did not understand is that while Christianity is indeed revealed within and through the created order, it is not another institution of common grace alongside of, of those familiar Groups of families, of schools, of, of businesses, and government. Yes, Christianity served within that capacity, but it was not to be identified in that way. Instead, what Christ and the apostles proclaimed is that Christianity is an expression of his heavenly kingdom. Christianity is nothing less than a breaking of, 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 of an entering and breaking of heaven into this world, into this present evil age. And it happens not in random ways. It happens not in human ways. But Jesus and the apostles make clear it happens according to God's ways the means that our Lord himself has established, means that are surprisingly ordinary means by comparison to other ways and methods. We might th see the means of Christianity to be particularly humble, sometimes uncomfortably so. Humble means, humble men. The idea of that kind of humble, ordinary Christianity <laughs> deeply troubled 
the Corinthian church, just as it often troubles the church today. How often do we find ourselves, I'm I'm speaking broadly now about the Christian church and Christian community, how often do we find ourselves, well, rather shy about embracing the ordinary? We're usually not inclined to talk about an ordinary spouse or house. We don't usually celebrate our ordinary school, an ordinary job, an ordinary church. We're far more interested in change, but not just any change. We want manageable change. We want change that serves our interest, and if at all possible, change that's exciting. A change that scratches our back, a change that inspires our affections. Paul says to Corinth, and he says to all of us, if you are seeking after that, if you are seeking after that kind of Christianity and that kind of life, you will never be satisfied. Rather, you will be disappointed. It's true whether or not you're seeking that kind of change in your spouse, your house, or even your church, isn't it? This morning, let's think a little bit more about each of these points. The message of Christianity, the means of Christianity, and last and briefly this morning, the men of Christianity. When we think about the message, what can we say about the message of Christianity? Well, if we put it in in positive terms, the message of Christianity is of God. The message of Christianity has been determined by God. It is defined by God. It is from God. And it is about God. (laughs) Negatively, the message of Christianity is not of man. It's not been determined by man. It's not defined by man. It's not from man. And as much as we chafe at the idea, the message of Christianity is not about you and me. If we think about long enough, we should say, praise God, hallelujah, it isn't. How many of us really want our stories proclaimed from the hilltops? Praise God that the message of Christianity is all about him and the gospel. And it's for us. It's for sinners like you and like me. The Bible identifies this message As gospel. The Bible speaks about this message of Christianity as the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel which God determined and established already before the foundation of the world. It is the gospel which God Himself came to define through uh, the Old and the New Testament ministries. It is the gospel which is all about Him and His Son. His eternal Son, who took on our flesh, Jesus Christ. John 3.16, it's about God's love for the world through which He gave His only begotten Son. That's what the Gospel is all about, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you see, that is the very grace, that is the very gift and grace that Paul is referring to at the beginning of Corinthians and the greeting of Corinthians and the thanksgiving of those first verses, the grace of God that has called them, that it calls the Christian out of this world and into a very true, lasting, vital union with Jesus. That's the grace the Apostle Paul is proclaiming. On the one hand, it is miraculous. Heaven breaking into the created order. On the other hand, the gospel is ordinary. It's ordinary in the sense that it has been determined and established by God himself. It does not change. Kids, think of a sunrise. A sunrise is ordinary only because it doesn't change. It It rises in the east and the sun sets in the west. That doesn't make it any less special, does it? It just makes it 
ordinary. Likewise, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it does not change. It's like the sun and the solar system. The gospel is a constant presence, a constant power, a reality, and a message that does not change. What does change, however, are the circumstances within which it comes and the people who engage it. And that's what Paul is speaking to in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, when he speaks of the Jews and the Greeks in this way. He says, well, the, the Jews, what are they looking for? They're looking for signs. The Greeks, what are they looking for? Well, they're seeking after wisdom. For those people... The unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ is a disappointment. But then there are others. There, there's an other people, sometimes including Jews, sometimes including Greeks, and other people that, that Paul says, for, for us, the, the gospel is the power of God for our salvation. The Apostle Paul really cuts to the quick emphasizing that he doesn't really care where the audience comes from. He doesn't really care about the makeup or demographic of the congregation, but he rather, he says what? We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. Dwayne Litvin, former president of Wheaton College, wrote a book about this, a book focusing in on 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, entitled The Theology of Paul's Preaching. And in that book, he explains uh, that, that approach to sp public speaking. He explains how Paul's approach to public speaking was unheard of in Corinth. The idea that the speaker's message was a constant. The idea that what the preacher would proclaim is unchanging. It was just foolish at best. And for, and for many of, of Corinth and, and other urban leaders of the ancient world, that approach to public speaking and communicating was a threat to cultured and civilized people of the world. Today, the idea that the ordinary gospel message unchanging, the idea that it is central to Christianity, the idea that the gospel is the truth and reality that trumps everything else, a truth and unchanging reality that, that trumps individual identity, that trumps family, priorities, educational theories, work, politics. Well, the Corinthians thought it was crazy. How many today, when you press the message of Christianity like that, would agree it is foolish at best? But then again, not, all, not everyone agrees with that conclusion. Some some hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some hear the preaching of the cross and hear the sweet song their soul has always longed to have. They hear life in the midst of death. They hear hope in the midst of despair. They hear and share in the very power of God. Notice then in the second place how this happens how this change within humanity takes place, it is through the means. The means, just as the message of Christianity is of God congregation, so also the means of Christianity are of God. Jesus puts it like this, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them all that I have commanded you. You see, it's, it's an ongoing emphasis upon the, 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 the ministry of the word and the sacrament. 
And, and we might actually be surprised at the way that the Apostle Paul uh, uh, speaks of that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, saying that Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The point that he's making here is not that baptism, the Lord's Supper, or the sacraments are not important. The point he's making is that the centrality of that ministry is the preached word. It is the preaching of the holy gospel. Now it's good and it's important for us to remember that, it, that at least at these early chapters, the problem that Corinth faced was not a confusion of the gospel message itself, but rather of the means. You see, most often in, in Christian tradition and understanding of this text, when we hear Paul speak about this preaching of the gospel, we, we assume that the opponents are responding to the gospel, to the cross itself. And while that is often the case, what he's emphasizing in these first chapters is that the preaching of the gospel is at issue. That's why uh, Paul goes on to say in verse 17, preaching not with words of eloquent wisdom. And a few verses later, he talks about how the Greeks were hungry for that kind of thing. Greeks seek after wisdom. Now you've got to hold with me here in our second point. It's a little tricky, but it's incredibly important. What Paul is doing is contrasting here the means of Christianity, namely the preaching of the gospel, with the Greek pursuit of eloquent wisdom. If we put it in a simple statement, it's this. They wanted the gospel their way. They wanted the truth of the gospel to be brought into their life, to be proclaimed and taught in the ways they felt were most appealing and desirable. Again, Dwayne Lifton in his book explains this, saying that the Corinthian issue was not so much the gospel or the cross itself, but rather the preaching of that gospel. What they wanted was this eloquence, this eloquence of public preaching and teaching that was established as far back as Plato and Aristotle and especially Cicero. Now, if you're not an expert in the classics, you got good company because I'm not either. Uh, but I have done some reading to understand what's happening in this text. And, and what's being forwarded here is this eloquent form of communicating that depended upon a certain kind of argument, a certain kind of proof that would then convince the listener to believe a certain thing. So these, this way of communicating, even a way of preaching, that would depend upon a certain craft of the argument, presentation of the proof, that was believed to have the power to convince somebody to believe. Litvin explains that it became one of the leading entertainments of life. You see, it wasn't just something they found to be valuable and important. They found it to be exceedingly entertaining for them. It was valuable for all common institutions. That form of eloquence, of speaking, was valuable for life in the home, education, business, effective in politics. So the thought would go, why not the church? Why not apply these same means, which are so effective in the other areas of life, why don't we bring them into the church as well? Again, if we depend a little bit on Litvin's own study into the text and to the context of Paul's ministry, what we find is that Paul is arguing. Paul wants, to, wants us to understand that God and the gospel requires a whole different set of presuppositions. God and the gospel are not subject uh, to the ideas 
uh, to the presuppositions, the priorities of even the best, greatest, and most wise of the world. Indeed, uh, God and the gospel are working according to a whole different philosophy, a whole different understanding of the world and of humanity. What Paul is doing in his letter to the Corinthians is not arguing about uh, one preference or another. You prefer Paul, I understand. I, gotta, I like you the best. You prefer me. And there's others who like Peter. And, well, that's okay. Paulos, he's not bad. It's all just a matter of preference. That's not what he's doing. You read the text, what you see is Paul establishing a contrast and antithesis between this, this pursuit of eloquence and wisdom and preaching with the preaching of the gospel itself. Paul identifies himself how? Paul identifies himself not as a philosopher, but uh, as a preacher proclaiming what God has revealed. Paul identifies himself not as a debater, but as a witness. Someone who has seen the truth of the gospel and is now merely testifying to what he has seen. You see, uh, that's, what, that's what a preacher does. He doesn't craft his own message. He receives from the Lord and proclaims it to the world. That's what a witness does. He doesn't make up the facts. He, he remembers what he saw and he tells it to other people. Paul was called not to be a philosopher or a debater. He was called to be a proclaimer and testifier to the truth of Christ and the gospel. And here's where the real difference lies. Here's where the real difference lies. It's in the power we are, we are looking to. Christianity, you see, look to the power of God for the giving of faith rather than the, the persuasive power of human speech. Do you see? Let me, let me read from a few passages of 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. I'm going to read from three distinct passages. I'm going to do so rather quickly, okay? You can always look back and do some further reflection this afternoon. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul writes, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Sometimes we read that as if Paul said, says, For the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But it's not actually what he says there. He says, The word... The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. He's talking about the preaching of the cross, isn't he? But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. A quote from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 29. God already proclaimed and prophesied then just exactly how the means through which he would bring about the promised salvation. How about chapter 1, verse 26? For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in his own power, in his own eloquence or wisdom, that we might, none of us, boast in the presence of God. And how about chapter 2, verse 1? Applying it specifically now to himself, Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, remember... I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's a shocking thing when you consider that in its time and place what Paul is describing here is a form of communication that was considered foolish at best and 
revolutionary, destructive to the existing culture and civilization at worst. I'd suggest to you we're not far from that place today. One more time, an appeal to uh, Dr. Litvin. He tries to illustrate this, and I think he does so very effectively with an appeal, an illustration to a formula, a simple formula, kids. A plus B equals C. And, And what he does in this illustration, he says, let's just assume for the moment that this formula can apply as well to the Greek philosopher or preacher as it can to the Christian preacher. And let's further assume for the moment that the equal sign, the result or the goal of each is faith, knowledge and trust in the truth. Now what's particularly distinct then is what's on the other side of the equation. In fact, on the far other side, what we find is, well, it's interesting, we might have another similarity The audience, the audience that is going to be addressed by the Greek philosopher or the Christian preacher, it may be the very same audience. And so we can think of the audience as a given. What then actually distinguishes? Well, it's that A plus B. It's that that, that element of the speaker's craft. The Greek philosopher, the eloquent expression of wisdom, places its confidence in the craft, in the argument, in the proofs themselves. So that if faith comes, it comes as the result of the craft of the preacher or teacher or philosopher. And the Apostle Paul says that understanding of means is detrimental to to, to Christianity. Rather, what we do in seeking the goal of true saving faith and addressing the same audience or congregation is to express what God himself has already revealed, to testify what Jesus Christ has already accomplished, to speak of all that he has commanded, trusting not in our own abilities of argument and persuasion, but only in the power of God, the Spirit of God himself. That's a radical difference, congregation. It affects the ways that we pray It affects the ways that we prepare, you and I. It affects what we expect to encounter when we gather for worship. Is the expectation to be some some engagement of, of the speaker's craft? Is our expectation that we would be brought through the experience of being Persuaded? Is the expectation that we would be brought through the experience of being converted again and again and again? Or is the expectation, the prayer, that we would come into the presence of God once again, that we would hear from Him that same word, that same unchanging truth of the gospel, and that He would bring it to bear upon our hearts? You see, it changes everything. We should be clear that the point Paul is making is that it's not that he was uh, being irrational. It's not that Christian faith is unreasonable. In fact, quite the opposite. But rather that the power of Christianity is not within the means. The humble means of Christianity are entirely dependent upon the power of God himself. As God comes through the message and the means and humble men. We're going to be brief on this third and last point, and I want to highlight for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul continues to say, And remember, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, 
but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <laughs> What's the apostle saying? But that, okay, I understand in comparison to Cicero, when compared to the great speakers, philosophers, debaters of our age, I am nothing. And, and I demonstrate my own weakness as I come to you with such humility, with fear and with trembling. The last thing I want to do is hold up myself and somehow make me become the center of it all. Don't look to me, Paul says. Don't trust in me. Trust in our great God. Submit yourself to him. Believe in his power. Dr. Horton, in his book, Ordinary, illustrates something of this. In chapter 6 of his book, Practicing What We Preach, No More Super Apostles. He begins the, the, the chapter appealing to something from the American Revolution. He writes, The United States was born in a revolt against royal tyranny. Colonial flags bore slogans like, Don't tread on me, and we serve no sovereigns here. The alternative was not anarchy, but a, a settled constitution for a republic that would be ruled by laws rather than by human beings. Yet the protest against earthly sovereigns bled into a religion of self-sufficiency before God. No longer pawns of royal and aristocratic ambition. Each citizen was now free to pursue his or her own ambition as long as it did not interfere with the ambitions of others. That kind of thing requires a certain kind of leader, doesn't it? That kind of work requires a certain kind of men to accomplish. And, and what does it inspire? But it, in certain, it inspires a certain kind of spirit and a certain kind of freedom. And in appealing to Paul in 1 Corinthians, Dr. Horton warns the church. He warns us about looking for those kinds of leaders. He warns us about cultivating that kind of revolutionary experience. Why? Well, because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Because the Apostle Paul belabors the point that the kingdom will not come through that kind of leadership. That kind of leadership that compels faith and trust within the people. Rather, what Paul appeals to, what Jesus and the apostles help us to see is that God calls a certain kind of man to ensure that the message and means of Christianity endure. And what were those kinds of men? Well, those who were not great, those who were not mighty, those considered unwise. Uh, they, they weren't the movers and shakers of the world that Jesus called, but what? He called fishermen. He called the lowly tax collectors. He brought the fruits of the kingdom to the outcasts, those who were nothing in that time and place, adulterers, Samaritans, women. Jesus and the apostles demonstrate that God is interested not in the strong and mighty of the world. He's interested in the weak and the lowly. Jesus, the apostles, did not come for the healthy. He came for the sick and the sinful. And so when we think about leaders for the church, men who are called to speak on behalf of Jesus, what are we looking for? We are looking for people who will embrace that kind of humility before the, the, the Lord and that kind of humility before the world. We are looking for people who are willing to be called ministers, you know what that means? It means a servant. The Apostle Paul will equally describe it as a slave, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus does. He calls ministers to be servants, slaves of his word, that they would do nothing but proclaim what he has spoken. They would do nothing but testify to what they themselves have seen of the gospel. And alongside those servants are shepherds, called elders. 
Shepherds were not the most celebrated place of ancient life, were they? But they were important in ancient life. Important to keep the gifts of God together, safe, fed. And likewise, deacons. A deacon is another expression of servant, carrying on a kind of shepherding, caring, providing role, extending the mercy of Jesus. What the Apostle Paul is saying in places like Timothy and Titus is that the message and the means of the gospel, God has decided to to, to complement that with certain men, calling certain men who express that same kind of thing in their very character and their very way of life. And how do you identify it more than anything else? They are humble and dependent upon the Lord, boasting in nothing of themselves, but rather relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen and guide them. We've had an officer's training class throughout the summer. Mr. File did most of it. Reverend Coleman, myself, we participated in it yesterday. And a sweet thing to see the Lord still at work to cultivate within the hearts of humble men the gifts of the Spirit who are inclined to, to serve, and we should praise God that they do, because it is the message of God, it is the means of God, and it is the men that God calls who will bring to us the greater coming of Christ's kingdom. And in closing, as we emphasize these things, as we emphasize the message of the gospel, namely the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, as we emphasize the means of the gospel, namely the ministry of the word and the sacrament, and as we emphasize the men, let us remember that Christ and Christ alone is the center. Christ and Christ alone is the center of Christianity. Everything revolves around him. Everything. Including the message the means, and the men. Important, yes, but not alone. If you think about Christ, the center, what we have is revolving around him, the message, means, and men's that that he has ordained and that he has called, and along with them are are the families, the friends, the, the, the counselors. How important are they speaking into our lives about the things of Jesus? We're going to think about that next week. We're going to think more about ordinary Christianity, it's the church and the family. As we do, pray with me that what we place our trust in is not in the ability that I have to create an argument, to present a proof, to convince you. Pray with me that God himself would meet with us. Pray with me that God himself would speak to you Pray with me that God would exercise the power of the Holy Spirit within your heart and mine. Amen. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the wonder of your word that you have spoken and that you have now brought to us. We thank you for the word of Christ, the gospel. And we thank you, O Lord, that it could be proclaimed. We pray, Father, that you would take all that is true and good and faithful and that you would apply it unto our hearts for a greater sharing of Jesus Christ, a growing in his grace. Oh, Father, spare us, we pray, of being led astray by other thoughts, ideas, or philosophies. Spare us from the errors of men and women, and help us, we pray, to find our hearts captivated. Help us, we pray, to be inspired and strengthened by you. May the Holy Spirit be the power of Christ within our life, May the Holy Spirit bring Grace Church into a greater sharing of Jesus, a greater coming of your kingdom, a greater expression of your love to each other and the world. In Jesus' name, amen.